Hey everyone, Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at ARCA, back again for another edition of That's Our Two Satoshis Live. For those doing this for the first time, we do this every week, every really for six years now since we started. We've been writing about the digital assets market on our blog, which you can find on our website, ar.ca backslash blog. It's called That's Our Two Satoshis. Then we come on here and we talk about it and usually grab a guest or two. And today, uh, real happy to have uh, Phil Bonella, uh, someone I've known in this space really probably since getting into the space back in 2018. Uh, he's been in a lot of places, Grayscale, Ikigai, Masari, uh, and most recently running uh, Plain Text Capital, investing uh, in the digital asset space in the liquid market. And Phil, first of all, thanks for coming. And second of all, uh, uh, I think you and I maybe share some frustration with what's going on in the markets these days. So looking forward to, uh, to having a chat with you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, absolutely. Yeah, it just uh, it's, it's been interesting seeing kind of the the token issuances over the over the last six months, I guess. Yeah, and before we get into that, just a quick disclaimer for everyone: uh, you know, if this is not investment advice, please consult uh, uh, your own policies. We're just going to talk about the markets here as we do every week. So, so let's get into that, Phil, because I think um, you know I saw a tweet of yours uh, in the last week, basically saying, you know, I don't know what the fix is for token issuances because teams need money and investors need to be compensated, but obviously the model's not working. I think. Um, you know, this was something that's been going on for a while uh, in terms of our thoughts uh, on the market and I guess um, maybe accentuated a little bit in the last 30 days just because we've had a couple of deals that have come that have gone straight down, maybe partly because of the market, partly because of structure. Uh, and then, of course, um, with Eigenlayer uh, and, and the recent drop, um, getting a lot of heat, uh, certainly on crypto Twitter for the treatment of uh, uh, certain residents, depending on where they live, as well as uh, uh, the way they were uh, using and, and, and potentially farming for points and tokens with that drop. Um, you know, why don't you spend some time? Like, first of all, what do you think is the most wrong here? And then we'll get into maybe some potential fixes. I think the token model or the point model of recent might be the most perverse that we've had from like the token issuance side of things, because it's sort of played out as a bait and switch in a lot of cases where um, points are expected to kind of turn into tokens, I think, from a lot of people in the market. And then what ends up happening is uh, there's this really big expectation built up. And then when the token generation event actually takes place, I think a lot of people are just disappointed. Um, and sometimes rightfully so, I think in the case of Eigenlayer, maybe people locked up a lot of capital and that's a lot of opportunity costs. And then if they aren't able to claim their tokens or, you know, they launch um, over like a really long investing schedule and maybe certain people get liquidity earlier than others, it's just, uh, you know, the incentive alignment isn't quite there. So again, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what the fix is, but uh, it seems like the, the point system isn't quite working in its current iteration. Yeah, and I, I'll even take a step back from there. I think, I think you know, if you go back to 2017, um, the ICO model actually worked, right? I mean, there's obvious reasons from a regulatory standpoint why 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 that you know needed to be you know if not shut down at least paused and 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 certainly at least in the U.S. kind of hard to bring back. But at least the ICO model, you're selling tokens to people who want it, and the market price is being determined by real supply and demand. Once we moved away from that model, in my opinion, crypto has just taken all of the things that do not work at all on Wall Street and haven't worked for decades and are basically saying, let's try it here. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, essentially what, what the crypto world is doing right now is they're doing a lot of pipes, right? Private in public equity. You have something that trades publicly, but then there's not a deep enough market for it. So you do a private uh, transaction, right? That's pretty much all that happens in crypto. You've got no barriers to entry to having a public token. You can list immediately on a DEX and in some cases, even on a centralized exchange. You have this public market liquidity. And yet all these token issuers are saying, well, if we need to raise money, we're going to do a private round instead. Right. So right away you're doing pipes, which, again, almost never see in the traditional world because they're not great. They're not great. Right. You do it by necessity, not because it actually works. So right away you're doing these locked up token uh, discounted deals to a, a handful of VCs for no reason when you already have an established public market. Uh, two is then you're handing it over to the exchanges, largely Binance and Coinbase, but some as well, and the market makers, and just saying, 
well, we're just going to list it arbitrarily at some price without any thought at all into what the right price should be. Um, even if you do a direct listing in the equity markets instead of an IPO, there's at least still usually uh, some consultants or investment bankers that are guiding to what the fair value of that price should be. Um, and at least they make some effort to price it at a price where it actually will go up in the secondary market. Um, whereas in crypto, it's just, hey, we're just going to give it to the exchange and the market makers and we're going to price it artificially high so that we can get a super high FTV so we can mark up our venture books. And then the tokens are destined to go straight down. And it makes no sense because every league table in the investment banking history talks about what the day one performance of a new stock or bond is, what the week one performance is, what the month one performance is. And there's a reason for that. They want to show that deals that are priced in the market trade up because it makes investors happy. It makes uh, uh, them want to come back for more deals. It makes the issuing company feel like they have access to the capital markets again if they need to. And again, we're just doing it totally backwards in crypto. We're saying... Let's just drop it on an exchange at an artificially high price, letting all the airdrop farmers dump it all at once so it immediately goes down. And it's just stupid. And it happens over and over again. And I've been talking about this for two years and nobody's listening and we just keep doing it. So even before we get into what you're talking about um, with the actual structure of who gets it and lockups and stuff like that, the process is just wrong. Yeah, I guess a, a, just a question for you. Do you think that this is partially driven by the fact that uh, people are just too eager to buy the token. And so the the it, the tokens, you know, come to market at an inflated price initially because everyone's just way too eager or like what is driving these like super inflated valuations? Because if there was no demand, you know, at the outset, then maybe we wouldn't even, you know, have this issue. Yeah, and it's a good question. I think there's a couple of things, right? First of all, you can you can discount almost any valuation you ever see in the private market, right? I mean, that's driven so simply by the timing of when you went to raise and how much you're trying to raise, right? So if you're trying to raise, you know, typically a round comes, let's say the first round comes at like a $10 million valuation. Maybe you issue, maybe you sell $1 million worth of a 10 million valuation, you sell 10% of the company. Then all of a sudden things are starting to do a little bit better and you're like, oh, well, actually, I need to raise 10 million because I have some real growth initiatives. Well, if you're going to raise 10, you pretty much have to raise it at at least a 50 or 100 million valuation because you're not going to sell more than 10 or 20 percent of your company. And then if you have to go raise 25, well, now you're talking, you know, 250 or 500 million or whatever. Right. So the valuations in the private market are largely driven by the needs of the company and the size they're trying to raise, not necessarily any real thought to what the actual valuation should be, which is fine. Uh, as long as eventually when you come public, there is some actual thought into what it is. And I think the problem is, is that a lot of these venture firms who are getting a lot of pressure for not distributing capital back to their investors are just looking to mark up their books and ultimately raise a vintage two or vintage three of their next fund. Um, so the valuation bump up, even if it's not sustainable, is more important than what the ultimate value is. So if you so then when you go to your um, your team and say, hey, it's time for you to list a token publicly. And they say, OK, well, how do I do it? They put you in touch with your Coinbase or Binance. They put you in touch with um, you know, a market maker to Wintermute or Cumberland or whoever. And they just say, this is our last round. You should price it at that price or higher. Um, and then they just throw it out there and it's just thrown to the wolves because there's not a developed buyer base, right? First of all, there's never there was no roadshow, right? Typically, when you do an investment banking deal, like you do a, you know, IPO or a bond deal, there's at least a roadshow to get people comfortable with it. So you're not even doing anything to develop new buyers. There's no roadshow. There's no discussion to get people excited about it. There's no thought at all on valuation or any outside third party research talking about why this is going to price it where it is and what fair value is. It just goes out there and the, and the idea is, well, you know, market forces eventually will correct and figure out the right price, which is true. All of that is true. There's no reason why you have to force the hand. But I'll give you two scenarios, right? Which is better? You price something at a, let's say it's ultimately going to be worth $250 million. Which would you rather, and let's say the last private round was at $400 million, but you know it's going to settle at $250, okay? Which is better? To price it at a billion dollars, put it on an exchange, knowing it's going to go down 75% to get to 250 million, but at least it came at an attempt higher than the last private round. Or you say, you know what? The first round we did was at a $50 million valuation. We're going to list it at that value because we want new investors to come in and feel the same as the old investors and feel like they're not getting, you know, uh, 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 feel like they get some special treatment and get to get in at fair value. We're going to price it at 50 million. And if it trades up to 250 million, great. I would say the latter is better, right? You end up at the same place anyway. 
And ultimately, you made some retail investors happy. You got them to become evangelists of your product, to feel good about being an early user of your product. It's no, it's, it's no different than the early ICO days, which is why I used to say that token launches were the greatest capital formation and customer bootstrapping mechanism we've ever seen because it allowed you to raise money, but it also allowed you, everybody to be in on the early floor, not just as an investor, but also as a user. And if you feel an early connection to something and also feel good because you made money, well, guess what? You become a power user, you become an evangelist, you become a sticky customer for life. All the things you want to encourage happens when people make money together. And the opposite happens when you basically burn everybody you know, in the first 30 days. And we put a chart uh, for those who are going to go to our website and check it out. I mean, we put a chart of, of all of the offerings in here basically in the last year and a half, especially with all these airdrops. And the median token is down 40% six months after pricing. So, and, uh, and, the, and two months after it's basically flat, you know, I think uh, up 2%. What's the point of putting it out there if you're not giving people a chance to actually make some money? And I would argue that the venture community would be better off if you said, hey, I know the last round was at 400 million, but we're going to put it out there at 100 million because we want you to get the same deals we did and feel good about it just like we did. And guess what? It's going to end up at the same place anyway, but at least you're doing it in a way that uh, 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 creates these power users and these happy customers. Yeah, I, I think that's right. In, in some ways, I've, I've always looked at crypto as being attractive in part because you can get vetra like returns in the public market and which has kind of been st starved from like the traditional world because uh companies were starting to ipo so late and i think part of what's happening here is you know these token generation events are happening too late after these massive rounds like it maybe just if the the token generation events were happening a little earlier in the business's life cycle so that they can maybe generate a little bit of money to keep the business moving along and also you know, give kind of retail participants the opportunity for those venture like returns. But it seems like we're kind of running back the playbook from the traditional world, which I've, I've historically thought that that was a, you know, a big opportunity for crypto, but it, it seems lately, that hasn't really been the case. It, well, and it still can be too. I think a lot of these yeah. projects, I think a lot of these projects are getting terrible advice from their early investors. I think they're getting terrible advice from the exchanges and market makers. And I think they're getting bad advice from their lawyers. Um, you know, I know everyone's terrified of the SEC. Everyone's terrified of, of, of doing any sort of a raise to U.S. investors. But almost all of these projects have a ton of their own tokens in their treasury, right? And almost all of them will eventually, at some point, make a deal with a market maker and give them a percentage of the tokens and say, hey, you know, use these to make markets, leak them out there. So let's say a token has, I'll just use some, make up some numbers here, right? Let's say a token has a billion total tokens that they could issue. And maybe a hundred million of them have been already given out to some venture firms and early investors. Um, they probably have another hundred to two hundred million at some point that they're basically giving to market makers over time to make market with as they start to leak it out to the public. But instead of doing these pipes like we talked about, where if they need to raise money, they do a private round at a discount to a handful of people, or they do this sort of airdrop where they just give it away and then they, you know, try to come up with a clearing price. What if they just put a sell wall up there? You already have the relationships with the market makers. You already have the relationship with the exchanges. What if you're like, hey, we actually are going to try to get rid of 50 million of our tokens. And we know that the you know market is pricing it right now at $4. We're going to just put a sell wall up at $3, fully transparent, tell everybody what we're doing. And guess what? It's going to sit there until, until it's gone. So every single investor knows that who the seller is. It's the company or the, you know, the project issuer. Two, they know that it's coming at a discount to where it was trading before, but unlike the private deals that go to five VCs, you actually have a fair launch here where anybody has the, op the opportunity to get it. It's fully transparent. It's just sitting there on one exchange as a sell wall and, and people will look at it and be like, oh, wow, you know, 50 million were listed there, but hey, someone just took 10 million of the 50. Now there's only 40 left. Oh, wow, 7 million just went. Now there's only 23 million left. And oh, I, I got to get in here. All of a sudden, instead of trading down to $2, you end up trading above where you started anyway, because people get into it, they get excited and they feel like they're getting a discount. So there's just a lot of different ways to do this that anybody with a capital markets experience would tell you that this is the right way to do it. And the way we've been doing it over and over again is just so wrong. So again, I, I, I don't know who's going to listen to this one today, but if you work at Coinbase or Binance, I'm telling you, you're doing it wrong. If you're a market maker, you're doing it wrong. Uh, if you're a early stage venture investor who have been giving advice to your projects, you're doing it wrong. If you're giving legal advice about not being able to leak it out there, it's also wrong. Like 
capital markets bankers have been doing this for centuries for a reason. It works. It works for both sides. And then you need to make some changes here. Um, and, and I think, you know, ultimately, if we do that, just like we evolved from ICOs to, you know, some of the, uh, uh, you know, like coin list offerings to ultimately, you know, some of these airdrops and points, like there's another evolution to be done here as well. And it's probably just go public immediately, like you said, right, get it listed on an exchange, get it listed on a DEX and start leaking your tokens out there to people so they can feel like they're getting in at an early level again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that buy, that uh, sell wall idea is it almost sounds from a functional perspective, kind of like an ICO. I, I don't know like how it differs legally, but uh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, the, the 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 first of all, there's tons of very smart lawyers in the space who know how to get around, um, you know, certain uh, issues here and there and, and, and to do it the right way. The way to do it, again, is like you're not doing it as an offering, right? You're not making it an offering. You're not um, uh, soliciting investors. You're basically just saying, these are our tokens we're leaking about. And that's it, right? There's no selling of it. There's no soliciting. There's no presentation. It's just no different than they're doing it anyway, only they're doing it without anybody knowing about it because they put it in the hands of the market makers. Yes. Right? You put it in the hands of the market makers anyway, and you say, just put it out there. And guess what? You probably don't even have to say anything because if people listen to us and people listen to others talking about it, it'll leak out there anyway. Be like, oh my God, somebody put a sell wall out there. Eh, it's, probably just the, it's probably just the project uh, owner. They're trying to get some out, right? So you don't even yeah. have to say anything. It'll just be assumed because who else would be the one putting it out there? So there's just very easy ways to do this that actually empower the end investor and the end user and and actually helps you create long-term sticky use. I mean, look at, let's just use Binance, for example, right? There's no doubt in my mind that part of the reason Binance was so successful was because of the BNB token, because the BNB token was, was a fair launch. It was priced cheap. Um, it made every early user actually feel like they were early and made them want to tell others about it. It made them want to trade on the site more. It made them want to use it more. Versus today where it's like, hey, I'm just going to use it to farm the token and the points up until they actually launch the token. And then I'm never going to touch it again. It's completely antithetical to uh, what you're trying to achieve, right? You want to create power users and sticky users for the lifetime of the project, not uh, mercenaries who use it up until you get the token out there. And then the project just dies. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there's a, I think there are other better ways to do it, certainly. Um, and uh, I hope both project issuers, uh, again, and exchanges and market makers and lawyers and early venture investors uh, start to get a little more creative than what we're doing, because it's clear based on the numbers, uh, based on the the uh, uh, results that it's not working. And, and I'll tell you this as well. And, and I'd be curious your opinion, like the fact that we're even talking about this is a bullish sign for the market, right? Whether you're talking about equity markets, debt markets or, or, or token markets, when you see increased new issues, it's a sign of a healthy market, right? You can look at any graph of IPOs by year and guess what? IPOs were there was a ton of IPOs in 2020 and 21. There's not that many in 2023. Uh, there weren't that many in 2008. Um, same thing with token launches, right? You you have more token launches in a healthy market. Um, so it's a good sign that we're even talking about this. But a healthy market can go to a bad market really quickly if every single deal fails. Yeah, I agree. And I, I mean, I optimistically, I think we've reached kind of a tipping point, and hopefully. The market will, of course, correct a little bit here, um, and we'll see some kind of better, better drops in the future. Yeah, and you and you'd mentioned in in the, in the tweet that I looked at, um, you had mentioned a couple models that you think can actually help um, with some of uh, with some of the teams that need money. And, and um, are any of those something you're comfortable talking about in this uh, venue? Yeah, I, th I think one that is interesting, and their token is launching within the next week. I think is Morpheus. Um, Morpheus did a fair launch or the, I mean, they haven't even dropped their token yet, but, uh, they did a 90 day bootstrapping period where you could contribute staked ETH to the pool. Um, and then they would, I think, distribute 24% of the token supply to all the people that, uh, staked ETH proportion to the amount that they staked. Um, and then they have a couple different, uh, pools of capital, but you know, there was no private round for Morpheus, but. Um, you know, I don't think that they're going to have any issue as far as funding the project. It's a, um, you know, it's a very decentralized project, you know, with, uh, core contributors, but not really like a core team. Um, and so I think that that's an interesting model. Uh, I think it, it's important to, it, it depends on the kind of project that you're launching. If it's an application, I think that's a little bit more tricky, but if it's more of like a protocol or like a deep in type project where, um, contributors can can provide compute or they can provide code 
and contribute in all sorts of ways and you can have a long supply schedule. I think that's always pretty interesting, like following in kind of Bitcoin and Ethereum's footsteps, Bitcoin specifically. Um, BitTensor did something similar over the last few years, like they have super high inflation. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings a lot of talent to the protocol because there's a lot of money. Um, obviously, that inflation can be a, kind of a double edged sword because in the early days, those contributors come to the project, you know, they uh, they work really hard, they make a lot of money. But once token price goes up sub substantially, that inflation can weigh on the network. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think high inflation in the early days, tapering off, you know, as a project goes on um, and having a really long uh, supply schedule is good for a project that is trying to tackle a really big vision because typically you're going to need to incentivize people to come back and contribute to the project over time. Yeah, and I think, you know, what's interesting, I saw a couple people, you know, if you're monitoring crypto Twitter, Twitter or blogs or, 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 you know, people speaking publicly, there's been a lot of hate in the last couple of weeks, right, on the, on the new issue process and uh, everything from what we've already talked about, as well as um, just the structure of the deals, right? These high FDV, low float, how much tokens are going to the team versus early investors, et cetera. But a lot of the part that I think is, is, is I'm in line with you on is that there's been an over focus on the fully diluted value. Um, you know, if you think about a company as, uh, who issues stock, right, there's very rarely a real cap on how much stock they can issue, right? You can always go back and, and you know, file a new shelf and issue more stock. So if you actually looked at every company in the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ and said, what's the FDV? It's way higher than the market cap because everyone knows that they can come and issue uh, whenever. Now, granted, if it's a company that's constantly raising, then the market will start to price in um, that additional stock sales as well. Um, and, and, and ultimately what that means from a dilution standpoint, but, but it's not unique to have extra supply that eventually comes to market. I think what's killing this crypto though, is that we immediately jump to that conclusion, even if it might take 20 or 30 years to distribute all of those tokens, right? And we also completely discount the fact that just because a company or a project is inflationary on day one, doesn't mean it can't be uh, an amortizer eventually later, right? Like what if, what if, as you said, you have a token that issues maybe 10 or 15% of the market, has this big inflation schedule, and maybe it's front loaded because they have to incentivize people, but those incentives actually work and they start creating a ton of money and that money goes in the treasury. And now they start buying back their tokens and all of a sudden you're, you're decreasing that inflation. So I do think we've gone too far, right? 2018, 19, 20, nobody even really looked at FTV. Now everybody's looking way too much at FTV because there's a lot of levers in there um, that a project can do with regard to how they, you know, you might even start seeing some token swaps. I mean, I've been advocating this for to a couple of projects over the last couple of years, like two pretty similar projects in the same space. Well, guess what? If you're sitting on your own treasury, it's not doing a whole lot for you, right? You can't really sell it that easily because the market will punish you for it. Plus, there's not that many mechanisms to sell it. It's not doing anything for you sitting in your own in your own token. Well, why not swap with some other project? What if, you know, imagine if like Uniswap and SushiSwap just gave away 10% of their token to the other one. Well, now all of a sudden you have a, a little bit of a diversified treasury and you have um, uh, 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 a means to actually monetize it without, you know, in, in a friendly kind of competitive way. There's all kinds of different things you can do here where just staring at that FTV and assuming that that's the size of the project is just incorrect, right? So I agree with you. I think, I think um, you really kind of have to look at these things in, in more like a six to 18 month lens and reevaluate based on the success of the project, how much capital they need, um, and, and, and any other levers uh, they might be able to pull either from a token issuance or a, or a buyback perspective. Yeah, for sure. I think I think maybe the one issue there is like when the FTV is so egregiously high and then there you know, might be you know, an unlock coming up in six months, it might kind of hamper an investor from really taking a bullish perspective on for on sure. that uh, on that project. Well, let's be honest. The guy who basically pioneered the uh, low float, high FDV launch is about to go to jail for twenty five plus years. So why we're still modeling after uh, uh, after that is 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 a little bizarre as well. Um, well, Phil, listen, it was really good having you on here. I think um, one of the things I always appreciated of you was your was your unique perspective. You know, having worked at basically a long short hedge fund um, as well as a large um, you know uh, asset manager who focused you know mostly on Bitcoin and large caps. Um, to obviously Masari and the research to now doing your own fund, uh, you know, with the wisdom you've gained over the last, you know, almost a decade here across these different areas. Um, anything else with specific marketing conditions or things that you think uh, is relevant to the market right now, either about your own firm specifically or about uh, market conditions that you want to get off your chest while I'm giving you a little bit of a, a venue here? 
I mean, I, I think that the market is really starving for applications that work really well. Um, and I think that's also part of what's been uh, kind of unfortunate with some of the token launches that people are eager for some of these new projects to launch tokens so that they can invest in great products. And so when the tokens launch at such high uh, valuations, that's tough. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I think we're sort of in like the post.com era for for uh, crypto here in that the infrastructure has been built out. The infrastructure has been invested in very, very heavily. And now we need you know applications that people can use. And I think we might be in a period of, you know, maybe like slower growth, but really sustainable growth and um, kind of the golden age for crypto. Um, maybe not as much fast money, but uh, I think in, in some ways that's good. So um, I, I think we're kind of seeing that right now with some of the uh, dismay with the pace of progress. But I think the progress is good. It's just it's just slow and it, it takes time for uh, great products to come to market. Yeah, I agree. And, and we're, you know, one of the, we talk about that a lot internally as well is like, you know, if the 2020 21 run was really led by kind of growth in stable coins and DeFi and to some extent NFTs, what is it going to be this cycle? If there is a cycle, is it going to be, uh, and really what, where is the consumer applications going to be driven from? Right. And one of the things we've been talking about, I'd be curious if you agree or disagree to this, but like meme coins are, are, are clearly working as an on-ramp at least, right? It's getting people into the ecosystem, getting them to set up wallets and exchange accounts. Um, maybe not the most sustainable product, but at least sort of an on-ramp. Um, Deepin and gaming seem to be the areas that I think could maybe have the most um, consumer traction, especially where the end user may not even know that they're interacting with crypto. Um, you know, we haven't seen anything really get to that kind of 10 to 50 million, you know, person user yet, but, you know, actually, you know, was knocking on the door a couple of years ago at 3 million users. I think you could see a game get to 10 million users. I think you could get a deep in application that could get to 10 million or so. Anything anything that you're looking at that you think can, can really drive adoption here? Yeah, I, I agree with both of those. Um, I think the the GPU, like Airbnb for GPU is an interesting model, but um, I think the focus has been on kind of the highest tier GPUs. But there's, a, you know, these, these decentralized networks are good for finding unused supply and bringing supply to supply to the network, but there is no supply of the highest tier GPUs, which are typically used for training. I think it, it works better for like second tier GPUs, which can be used for inference. So, you know, networks that are targeting kind of that second tier, like 3090s, rather than like the A A100s, hundreds, H one hundreds, which, you know, there aren't any, there's no supply out there for those. So you can't actually build up the supply side and actually then, you know, bring demand later, you have to target you have to target the the area of the market where there is supply sitting around and like people might have old GPUs, you know, in, in uh, like old Ethereum miners or gaming chips or things like that, that can be used um, for maybe like uh, kind of retail type inference or like hobbyist type inference and stuff like that. Um, I think that's an interesting one. I agree with you on gaming. I've been struck by, you know, like in the in prior cycles, UX has been so atrocious that you you're never going to get 10 million users to to onboard to some of these these games but i think this time around some some games like i think uh, parallels done a good job mm -hmm. in having their game go first and you don't actually have to be a crypto user to 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 play the game but then if you want to go like the the next level deep then you can start to interact with crypto so i think that tiered tiered model is good get everybody in you can play the game without having to be a crypto user and then if you want to you know go the next level deep and own your in-game items earn some tokens whatever it may be then you can actually uh use crypto so i think those are two good good ones i've also been pretty interested in in the music side of things um yeah i, I think i think music is an interesting one because uh it doesn't require a ton of scalability from buying and selling music it might be kind of low volume but actually listening so the music will be really high volume and from a blockchain scalability perspective um reading the information doesn't uh reading the information from the blockchain uh, doesn't take a lot of uh throughput it's the writing that congests the blockchain and creates a bad experience for users so yeah i, I think music could be an interesting one but that's it, it's also been kind of a slow uptake yeah for sure. 
Um, well, listen, Phil, appreciate you coming on. I think we're bumping up on time here, so I'll let you go. Um, for anyone who wants to hear more of Phil's thoughts, you can reach him uh, on Twitter at Phil J Bonello, um, or you can check out uh, uh, his firm, Plain Text Capital, uh, at their website, plaintextcapital.com. And of course, you can find more uh, about Arca's thoughts on our website, ar.ca, or you can find me on Twitter at jdorman81. Uh, again, Phil, thanks for joining. Uh, we'll be in touch. And for everyone else, thanks again. We'll be back next week with another topic. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot, Jeff.